Welcome to Making a Difference. Today our special guest is Daniel Tenenbaum. Daniel, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. So I'd like to start out by asking you, um, what experience or experiences in your life led you to become so involved in philanthropic activities? Well, I think um, I have to go back to my college days when I was uh, very involved in, in student politics. I'm originally from Montreal, Canada and uh, from, I was elected pre president of McGill Student Association at the time. And uh, while that, that was a nonprofit and a, uh, it was certainly a nonprofit, it, and it, it wasn't necessarily a charity, but I was starting to see, boy, what kind of uh, a difference a person can make uh, outside of the business world uh, using some of those same business skills, because I was a student in the business faculty at the time. Uh, to, to really help and I impact people's lives. And uh, from really that point on, there was a beginning of a, a, a pretty long trajectory of always balancing uh, my business life, my, my personal life, but also an important part of my balance of my life has always been uh, involvement in community and nonprofits. Who have been your friends or family that have been inspirational to you to become so involved? That's an interesting question um, because I think it's something that goes beyond my friends and family and, and uh, it, it's something that I've really picked up uh, really on my own and uh, if you looked at some of my, my although my family have been involved uh, in a peripheral way within charities or even my best friends, uh, it, uh, I, it's really my own trajectory that through my own personal experiences that uh, have gotten me to be more involved. So um, you sound like a self-motivator. Is that the I, good? Yes, yes, and a self-motivator, and also someone who, who who really believes in balance in life. So it, that and part of that balance means not only taking care of myself and my family, uh, but also taking care of the greater community. And and my days are balanced, so, so that I'm you know I'm not spending all of my time just doing one thing. I like the the, the ability to mix it up. So give us an example of a day, how you mix it up. Well, I, you know, I, I happen to be involved in the real estate world, and uh, actually, which the downturn of the real estate has been a beneficial, be, was beneficial to my involvements in charities. And in fact, I was just talking to some other people who have gotten involved, uh, more involved civically and whatnot, because of the who were, who were in real estate. And uh, it's it, I've been able to t take advantage of that. So, you know, I'll spend perhaps if you want to call it an eight-day, eight-hour working day, I'll spend six hours. Uh, doing my work, but I'll be be going to board meetings, uh, involved with uh, some of my charities, and uh, probably on average two hours a day. And so it probably takes up about 25 percent of my time these days. That's significant, and for a young man, that's a lot, especially somebody who's still active in business. Yes, uh, maybe I would like to be a little more active in business at this point, but that's uh, I, like I said, that's uh, the, the the real estate uh, reality is such that it may, sometimes it makes sense not to be in be buying uh, properties at, at certain periods of the cycle. My, my instincts are is that um, uh, our community is a great beneficiary of the slowdown of the economic environment, but that too shall change and you'll be very busy again in the next couple of years, uh, God willing, in your business. So, so l let me, that leads me to my next question. What organizations, give us some examples, do you have the greatest passion for that you're involved with? Well, I think I'd like to highlight two. Um, and one is the Jewish Venture Philanthropy, uh, Philanthropy Fund of Los Angeles uh, because act, that actually has been uh, the catalyst for me being involved in so many other charities. The, the Venture Philanthropy Fund is uh, a group of about 20 to 25 of, I would say, people within the age of uh, 35 to, to 55. Uh, so on the younger end of the scale of uh, people involved in charities. And we all donate not only our money, because we pool our money together, and we have applications from all over Israel and the United States for funding of charities that are, they've already had some success, but they want to go to the next level. And so it's kind of like an investment. We, we go through a period of uh, bringing down, let's say, that group of 130 down to to about 30 or so. And then we will uh, have a discussion and actually divide up into due diligence teams, not that dissimilar that you might find for, for an investment uh, at your firm. And, and really dig down and, and try to really understand not only where they're coming from, what their goals are, and sometimes it means transforming what they're asking their, uh, for money for. And when we get this diversity every year, of imagine getting 130 applications or uh, you're getting exposed to so many different charities 
And frankly, every year or every two years, there's one that just grabs me by the heart. And like, likewise for some of the, our other members of the Jewish Venture Philanthropy Fund. And it is a great way where we not only provide them with money, but we use our skills, our entrepreneurial skills, our legal skills, our marketing skills, to help them with their business plans, to, to get them to the, that next level. So we're not just donating money, we're donating our, our time and our skill set. And through being involved with this group, I've been involved with others and gotten on the boards of other organizations. And the one that I'm most passionate about today is uh, the Breed Street Shul Project in Boyle Heights. Is, is that the one that you would uh, state that probably gives is the best example of a beneficiary of that organization? Is, is, that, is that one of the beneficiaries of that organization? Yes, I think it, it's, we actually have quite a few uh, success stories. The organization has been involved since 2002. I, I, I'd like to hear a couple uh, success stories, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, there was a program that's called Night Owls in Israel, and this was an organization of, uh, that was uh, sent social workers to uh, the parks in areas that are heavily um, populated with uh, Russian immigrants. A as you know, in Israel there is a challenge to integrate all immigrants, but you know, particularly the Russian and Ethiopian uh, communities. And th what they did is that they would go out at nighttime, and that's the name Night Owls, to these parks to, um, to make contact with the, the youth, the Russian youth that were congregating there, uh, who were not really part of the main society, before the stage where they're at that quote-unquote ask at risk level and to, to get them involved in community events, sports, and things like that. And the beauty of what had happened is they had had success in a certain number of cities and we gave them funding to really expand it to a, a certain a few other cities within Israel. And the beauty of it is at the end of all of this, uh, they, the Israeli government uh, thought they saw the success and funded this and now this is a program that is throughout Israel. So that's an example of us uh, targeting a very specific period of time within the charity's organization and leveraging it so that it can really expand uh, and, and be even more effective. Sounds like a great investment. It's, it's exactly. It's one of our, our, we've actually had quite a few successes since 2002. And then on the Breed Street Shul project, it's really uh, the shul itself, as many of the viewers here may know, um, is the, was the, <clears throat> the largest synagogue between the First World War and Second World War, and it's situated in the Boyle Heights area of East the Los Angeles. The largest synagogue in Los Angeles. Uh, west of the Mississippi, actually. So all of western the U.S. It was an Orthodox shul, and it's uh, actually, there's two physical buildings, uh, including the front building, which is this uh, nouveau Byzantine, beautiful architecture building. Um, but it, it uh, basically, if you walked in there two years ago, it looked like uh, a synagogue might have looked like after the Holocaust. It was full of graffiti, holes in the wall. Uh, they had all kinds of things going on in there because in the early 90s, basically the congregation wasn't large enough to sustain it, and they physically walked away and and came the, the elements and, and some other locals who thought that they would take advantage of the empty space. Um, and, and so what we've been able to do as the Venture Philanthropy Fund is fund uh, A, the uh, salary of the executive director, which they never had before, uh, and then B, fund uh, a, a marketing plan and marketing material so that they can start the fundraising. And so just with this little um, help, they were able to take an organization that was very strong board and very nice group of people, but weren't moving the project forward uh, in a way that we, we could p get the, the building uh, working, and now, now they can. So is, is the building completed and renovated today? Well, right now, actually, uh, they have two buildings, and the rear building is expected, to, the renovation is expected to be, uh, be finished next, uh, next month. So, so one building will be finished next month, exactly. the first building. And your purpose here is to allow people to come visit and pray or just make it more like a museum? Well, it's going to be, it's, they're, they're no, they're, there's not a large Jewish population in Boyle Heights anymore, but it's part of the Jewish history there. So there will be not only a museum to, to show and tell the story to the local LA community because the Jewish community in Los Angeles has a history now. We've been, we've been here for a while. And so that they can understand part of Jewish uh, LA history by going there and the history of other peoples that have gone through Boyle Heights. But also since the, the main uh, people who live in, in Boyle Heights are the local Latino uh, population in an area that's very underserved 
uh, we're, we'll be able to provide uh, much needed uh, services in terms of social services. Uh, we'll have office space for charitable organizations uh, and performance uh, places. So I imagine that some days you'll have a uh, mariachi band there in the afternoon and, uh, and the next day perhaps there may be some uh, bar mitzvah celebration there the next day. Uh, it would probably be more of a reform uh, bar mitzvah but certainly uh, something where you really it's a, a bridging of the Latino communities and the Jewish communities. More Making a Difference after this. Can you give us another example of an organization that you've had a passion for that you've been involved with for some time? Well, um, there's a group call, uh, uh, called the Builders of Jewish Education, and they are a, uh, the group that oversees the Jewish day schools uh, in Los Angeles. And we, they came to us as the Jewish Venture Philanthropy Fund to say, uh, we have a program to put in place to target the decline in enrollment in Jewish day schools between the nursery school age children and the kindergarten and the kindergarten and elementary school. So we, if you look at it from a business point of view, uh, they had basically had all these customers at the nursery school level, and they would have a 50% drop off of their cu customers continuing on just to the next year. Why is that? And uh, so that's what we, that, that, that was what the challenge was. And so what we did is uh, we funded the market research to find out exactly why that was, and, um, and then to put a marketing plan behind it. And so to, 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 uh, to really educate people of, 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 of take, take some of the pre preconceptions that people may have had about the Jewish day school and allow them to. Um, Did you ever find out as the study finished? Do you know? Yeah, the why? study's finished. So and it, the it's reason actually, is? And the reasons are, as, as anything, it's, it, it's a complex issue. Um, it ranges from, um, number one thing is, is, is the level of education my child is going to have. So the quality of education uh, is often uh, ha had been some, one of the reasons that someone would take their child and put them into private Jewish school, which is really what the study was about. So we took the kind of financial aspect, which is a very important part of making the decision to continue on to Jewish day school, but we eliminated that and said, why would, why would you send your child to a private non-Jewish school versus a, a private uh, Jewish school? And so that was certainly one of them. And the, the, and the re and the, so the reason was to get a higher quality, they thought, of education at that next level by moving them to a non-all-Jewish school. Is that's, that right? That's correct. So that was number one. That's correct. Number two is? N number two is um, diversity. The, they felt that they wanted to have their children with more of a diverse group of people. And so what we've been able to do is to, to say, first, first of all, if, if, if your child is, for, for instance, going to Milken High School, the, your chances of getting into the top Ivy League schools are, are based on the statistics I've seen, are about equal to going to the top non-Jewish private schools. So there's a perhaps a misconception among some parents, I think, that's changing over time, that Jewish private school can give you not only the great private school experience, but also with the Jewish values and traditions at the same time. Uh, similarly, we, we're emphasizing how there is a diversity in, within our Jewish community. They come from all around the world. You know, in our, in our uh, the, where I send my kids, they're, they're, they, they're people from South Africa, uh, they're, they're, they're parents who are from Asia, they're pa parents from uh, a lot of different parts of the world, and uh, that's something that adds to the, to the diversity too. It's not, the, it's not so homogeneous as, as people may think. I think that's the right, the better term. Um, so let me ask you this, what would you tell young people today about um, the gratification of giving? How would you encourage young people to give today? Um, I would tell young people to explore, to find what their passion is, because the, the world of charities is so diverse. And so, what, uh, so I, the, the idea of just exploring one item, just because something happens at your school, to get involved with that, that may not be the thing that brings you passion. You, you know, with the internet out there, with uh, Facebook, and you know, find out what your friends are doing, and go visit one of their meetings, or find out what they're about. Because if you, it, the, the more um, you, the the more you seek out, the 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 more you'll find your passion. And ultimately, I believe that it's a passion that will drive someone's ability, you know, someone really wanting to continue to be involved in charitable work. So why are you so involved? 
what is it what gratification does this involvement give you on a personal level it it gives me this the satisfaction of making changes that people a appreciate but more importantly that they that it actually makes a difference that i just like in business you can come to a charitable issue a terrible problem to solve you know and use creative thinking create creative problem solving and help help an organization move to that next level to overcome the problem so the problem solving so the ability to be involved and help the organization so that they can help themselves is really so your sense of accomplishment is helping others and so by solving problems yes yes I mean the obviously the financial aspect helps too so I try to obviously they they want me to donate money as well but really what about your personal gratification my personal gratification is not so much with the funds that are giving it's it's the ability to to make a difference and that's the name of our television show so thank you again for joining us and sharing with us what your life's about and how much time it's amazing that you do this on a daily basis so I thank you Daniel for coming and I thank you for making a difference Making a Difference will return right after this. Welcome back to Making a Difference. Our guest today, Dan Tenenbaum, spoke of his support for builders of Jewish education. Here's a look at some of the fine work that they do. J Kid LA, consult your curiosity. J Kid LA. J Kid LA. J Kid LA. Consult your curiosity. Basketball, football, volleyball, and soccer. Every single color and every single bond represents a different element on the periodic chart. We've had friends who have gone from Jewish preschool into secular schools and have actually come back to the Jewish education world. And there's always a fear that if they're doing all this Jewish stuff and learning Hebrew, how are they going to be able to do the other stuff? Kids are incredible and they have a big mind and they will fill it with whatever you give them. The importance of a Jewish education for our children really is related to values. Developing not just their academic skills but also all of their other skills and discovering who they are and what they are and then also just the Jewish values that I think are um, for a lifetime. Well, it's my ninth year and I've been here since kindergarten. The school's exceeded my expectations in terms of how nurturing it's been. And all the extracurricular activities and all the enrichment, Judaica, Hebrew, music, art, I mean, uh, the list is endless. We had to pick either primary or secondary colors. I picked secondary to color it with and then outline it with black. Each child is different and the school really does try and build wonderful young people recognizing that they may learn at different levels. We learn about the Bible, Bible and Jewish and history and Jewish holidays. And I really like being able to learn Hebrew so then like when I go to Israel I can talk to everyone. Avon. It surprised me how much they really enjoyed learning Hebrew and, uh, and the Jewish subjects. So all of our kids so far have really taken to that and uh, in some cases they they, they like it better than the English subjects. I really would like to learn more about Latin. Conquering you! 
now we're also working on fairy tales that we'll be taping. I guess that's why she wrote this book. And the teachers understand like when you don't understand something. And we have a field trip coming up tomorrow where we're going to the aquarium, so everything is integrated. The fifth graders are right now working on an environmental film festival, so they are building their own films using iMovie, GarageBand, they're, they're composing their own score. This is my drama enrichment playbook. I'm in AP Chemistry um, and AP US History. Those two are taught by really amazing instructors, but they're really hard, obviously, but, you know, what can you expect? Yeah. He's a former Olympian, so yeah. I think he brings all these interesting uh, training uh, drills that normally we wouldn't get. Um, the one thing I have them keep doing is the delegation to the show. I don't know what it is about the school, but they just attract incredible kids, and those kids have just made my high school experience for me. Uh, the fact that there's a Judaica program in what is otherwise a very quality school doesn't undermine a student's ability to achieve, you know, admission to the college of their choice. I think that all Jewish families should consider Jewish education and take the time to explore all of their options. Uh, We as a family are definitely committed to a Jewish education elementary through high school. You have to actually go there before you can actually make up your mind. And to me, this is a wonderful school, and I'm glad I'm here. JKLA, consult your curiosity! Yeah! At this point, She's going to be going to high school next year, and she feels like she's ready to conquer the world. I applied to Berkeley, Stanford, UCLA, uh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown. Maryland, Brandeis, NYU, Berkeley, Harvard, Yale. UC Davis, Columbia, Wesleyan. Well, I know I want to be a doctor. I'm not exactly sure where I want to go. Because when I move on, I'm going to a Jewish high school, and it's a good basis for the rest of my life. I think that everything that we invest in pays us back. Yeah, I'm very happy that my kids are both involved with the Jewish day schools. They've started since nursery school, and I feel that all the private schools have very strong academics, and what a bonus that they get the Jewish values and identity. And Hey, check out my Jewish private school. From a future senator of California, I encourage you to consult your curiosity. Consult your curiosity. Consult your curiosity. Consult your curiosity. Thank you for watching Making a Difference.